So uh, between Jesus leaving and the Spirit coming at Pentecost, there is this waiting time for the disciples. Jesus' words to them are to stay in Jerusalem until the gift comes. In this in-between times, the disciples could have done very little. They could have just um, sat around and, and not really done too much. But they made four choices while they waited on the changes that the Lord would bring in the gift that is coming. I shared on the making of these four choices in the Wednesday podcast. Uh, these are the four choices. They choose to be together. Acts describes them as joining constantly together. They choose to pray when they are together. And they choose to identify their lives, these moments that they are in, in Scripture. Peter reads the betrayal of Judas and the need for another to take up his place through Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. And the fourth choice is to prepare to witness out of the living following of Jesus marked by his life, death, and resurrection. And it's the third of these choices that I wanted to turn to briefly this morning, the choice to, to tune ourselves to Scripture while change is all around us. And that's why this week, this is the objects. Look at that. Can you see that, George, that wee object there? You'll recognize this, wouldn't you, from, from various things. And uh, this, is, this is a tuner for my cello. And the strings in the cello, on any stringed instrument, are susceptible to the changes around them, the environment that they're in. They go out of tune. And the first lesson is always to tune the strings in the midst of that changing environment around it. The tuner, the tuner allows you to bring the string back to the tone that it was meant to be, even when everything is changing around it. All these choices made in the waiting time by the disciples may be part of that retuning of their lives in the midst of all the changes. But we're going to look at the third choice made here by Peter, that of reading our lives into Scripture to help us to be active in the waiting and as an active way to get our lives in pitch, whatever is changing around us. So what is Peter doing here? He, he draws on two passages to address an immediate question. That question is what to do after the death of Judas. What to do after the death of one of that core of close disciples. And Peter could have left that question hanging. And uh, we'll touch upon that shortly. There are those who think he should have left it hanging. But Peter has such an active faith. And even in waiting, there is something powerful about his commitment to take the question of the moment and explore it in Scripture, to seek direction in it. On the face of it, these two passages that Peter draws on may seem quite random. He just plucks them out of the air and says, let's make a decision on the basis of these. And that may be tempting for us to do that sometimes. But there are reasons why, they go, why he goes to these passages and why they speak into this moment. There are questions that arise in doing this, and Peter may not have got this right, and we'll touch on that also in a moment. But there is something about Peter's urgent commitment to pitch his life into Scripture that I find challenging and exciting. The events that Peter is responding to in the waiting time, this between time, are these. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, has died. He hanged himself in a field bought with the 30 pieces of silver. And where there, are, there were 12 disciples at the core of Jesus' ministry before, now there are just 11. And through these two passages, Peter wants to respond to that, to take this forward. And there is value in the process to take that forward. But I also think it offers us a chance to commit to making changes in the waiting time, but to take them with humility. This moment in the waiting time is of changes and choices, and I think it gives us a way to make decisions while also holding them lightly. So what does Peter do then? He opens up Scripture in a particular way, he identifies the moments that they are living in 
with these two Psalms, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. But why these Psalms? Well, Psalm 69, first of all, is, is present in the, the very earliest moments of, of uh, the disciples' lives with Jesus. And as, even as, as they headed towards the cross on that Thursday night when they are gathering around the table and sharing bread and wine, Jesus is, is pointing them to Psalm 69 as a way to understand what is going on. It says in John 15, verse 25, quoting Psalm 69, it says, but this, all that is to happen is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. Jesus is pointing to Psalm 69 as a way to explain what his life is about at this point. So when Peter draws on Psalm 69 to understand what has taken place with Judas, he is doing it with precedence from Jesus. He is reading their lives and the question of this moment into Scripture following Jesus. And in both of these Psalms, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109, there is a backdrop of David's and the betrayal of a close friend and advisor called Ahitophel, a betrayal that led Ahitophel to take his own life by hanging himself. So there is this parallel within these Psalms in the background, in the context. And Peter draws on that in this moment and looks to it to make decisions on the next step in the midst of all the changes that are taking place. And that next step is a positive one to bring Matthias into leadership, but on the basis of this wider calling to, to stand in the resurrection, to witness to the resurrection, one who can stand and witness to the resurrection. But it is this active responsiveness to the living word of the Lord for now that I find so appealing in what Peter does in this, that we are to pursue Scripture in understanding what our lives are about just now as a way to retune our lives, not simply to let life sit, but to let God's word address us and challenge us and bring us to decisions to make changes. We tune our lives through Scripture to the call of God while we're waiting the changes that only the Lord can bring. However, the balance to set against this lies in this. Matthias, who is drawn into this group of 12 through the process, he hasn't really heard of again. It doesn't seem to matter that this has taken place. And there are those indeed, to suggest that Peter got this wrong and that Paul was the intended 12th disciple after he saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. So how do we draw these tensions together? Well, I value Peter's intent in all of this. I think it speaks so highly of pursuing the Lord's direction in the midst of the waiting, of seeking his ways directly into our lives. But it also opens up the need, I suspect, for humility in pursuing the decisions taken in the waiting time or in any time. There is so much value in identifying and understanding our lives in Scripture. But there is also this sense in which we hold this with a light touch and humility. Because we're not God and we don't understand the full picture in all these things. I think in Isaiah's word from the Lord, Isaiah 55 says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And Micah's beautiful definition of what the Lord calls for us to do at any time. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But even with these words in our ears, there is also something beautifully active about Peter's moves here in the waiting time. As they look and wait for the changes that God will bring, here is a choice they make. Alongside being together and praying, here is a choice they make to read their lives through Scripture and to act on it. And this may seem, this may seem a strange word to preach this morning, to, to call to read our lives into Scripture, to understand the moments we are in through the Word of God given. 
to call us to act out of that reading of our words of our lives in Scripture, but then to hold that lightly and with humility, with an understanding that we may be wrong, but we still act. But that feels like the experience of now, when we too are in the waiting times, when so little is fixed and known, and yet we still need to live. We, we read ourselves into Scripture. We act out of that reading, but we hold that lightly while we're waiting the changes that only God can bring. We, we, we are following Peter in this, that in all that we are doing, we see what could be, and we pursue God in the midst of all of that, and yet all the time we are waiting for that which God alone can bring. And that's part of the excitement of this time, and the, the daunting quality of this time is that call to, to act out of Scripture, and yet wait on God acting in the bigger picture. But that feels like where we are just now. So this call this morning is to keep reading ourselves in Scripture, to do what we feel God is calling us to do, and yet to await what God is, is going to change around us so that he shows the way all the time. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of Peter and all his impulsiveness and all his commitment and all that he acts to do and pursues. And we pray, Lord, for a bit more of Peter's boldness in following you, but also for the humility, Lord, to know that you're God and we are not God. You're the one who knows the next step. We are the ones who seek it. Help us to be bold, but with humility, Lord, as we take the next steps together. In Christ's name, amen.